Hey. You. Hi there. It's 4.19. Do you have a minute? Good. Then let's pack a bowl. Cause it's time for Cannabis Talk. A special 420 themed segment of the Almost Daily Zencast. Hosted by Spiritual Cannabis Mystic, the incorrigible Mr. Zappa. Let's get lit, folks. Greetings and salutations to you, dear friends and listeners. It is I, the ever-eccentric, the ever-bizarre, the perpetually stoned, that's not actually true, but it's a good tagline, Mr. Zeppo, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo. And welcome to a slightly uh, behind schedule, because it's now 448. I wish it was 444, four, four. that'd be magical. But it was a hot second ago. Uh, maybe right when I hit record, actually, because it's three minutes and 22 seconds in. No, that doesn't make any sense. We sat through 444 four, four just a hot second ago, so hooray for that magic number. Uh, here we are, together again for the very first time. Thank you, Dave Brubeck. Um, and this is your favorite part of my show. Cannabis talk. What did I write uh, as the intro? Oh, I don't. I. It, it doesn't matter whether I actually just smoke some weed or not. Um, I never can't quite recite in the exact phrasing I used the blurb I type at the beginning of the process of getting ready to hit record. In fact, I honestly wish. And Sprecher dot com, if you're listening, I honestly wish that you could hit record. Go live and then fill in all that stuff afterwards. But I know that it doesn't work that way. And that it probably couldn't work that way. Not without some sort of boilerplate default that you always have. And then, you know, go basically just being able to go back and edit it later. At any rate, something along the lines of a discussion about the commodification of cannabis couture, which is happening, right? Five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I would have laughed at the idea of couture, cannabis, uh, culturally, and of course, uh, you know, uh, in terms of economic activity, it to me is total nonsense. 
But uh, here we are. We're commodifying the very culture we're creating as a community faster than real time. Uh, and it's bizarre to me. It's very, very bizarre to me. And uh, as a simple example, I was like, I'm sure I'll find an example if I open the news app on my Mac and click on my bookmark, 420, parentheses, cannabis culture. Off to the side, next to a, a Lonely Planet article about the best dispensaries, lodgings, and, quote, experiences in Denver, and directly under a Fortune magazine article about Elon Musk and the $420 price tag about one of his stocks or something, there's an article from Stylecaster. And this is what I'm talking about. And the headline, and I don't mean to, I haven't read the article. I'm not trying to bash whoever wrote it. I'm pointing out that articles like this, titles like this, make me think some critical thoughts about the cultural trending that we're experiencing. But here, here's the, the I'm not going to even read the article, so no offense. I just want to read the title. Actually cute weed clothing to wear while you celebrate 420. It's an article from, according to uh, Apple News, 41 weeks ago. And for whatever reason, there must not be a lot of fresh, cutting-edge cannabis culture articles or this bookmark, uh, as I have set it up or as it gets used, seems to have fallen off the the trending uh, uh, you know, statistics and metrics of cannabis culture. Because all the... Well, actually, no. The Lonely Planet article is only a week ago old. Then uh, there's a five-week-old article. The, the Fortune article about Tesla is six weeks old. There's a bunch of articles from about 40 weeks ago, though, that are really prominent. Like uh, three articles in a row, four, six articles in a row from a magazine I've never heard of called Mary Jane. Rock on. Good for you guys. Um, but hashtag send this to your mom. What does quote 420 friendly end quote mean? Mary Jane's 420 survival kit, the pot prepper's guide to something to stuff to what? What is it? It's the it trails off there to staying lit. Okay. All right. It's a funny reappropriation of the prepper vibe. Um, but I guess there must be end-of-the-world preppers that are also cannabis enthusiasts, right? <clears throat> and they must want to be prepared. Uh, and then, you know, all this, what I'm pointing out here from 39, 40-some-odd weeks ago, is articles about or preparing for or commenting on April 20th which is something that I personally have long advocated should be the cannabis community's international spiritual holiday and that we should be having an organized movement to ratify that day as such in every country that is currently slowly and gently decriminalizing cannabis. Because as soon as we get the idea out there, the fact of it out there, the reality of it out there in the commonplace, you know, marketplaces of the world that cannabis is fundamentally spiritual and not, categorically not, quote, a drug, end quote, the better things will be for us and the culture and those that are drawn to it or brought up in it in the near, mid, and not too distantly far future. Why, friends? Why do I posit that? Um, well, first of all, we're still in the midst of a very tumultuous recovery from a generation's worth of cannabis hate, of pot uh, vilification of the the marginalization of weed uh, and the impacts of that propaganda are still resonating deeply 
uh, at the cultural level, no matter where you are, no matter where you look, and no matter how progressive you might find uh, this pocket or that community or this town or that city or this state, there's still a nationwide and global sense or apprehension that that weed is bad. The devil's lettuce is no good to you, right? That hasn't gone away. The marketers, the profiteers that are breaking through the the traditional cultural mores of this community in order to make a buck, sure like to ignore the fact that there's still a lot of bias and prejudice against cannabis and therefore against those who are enthusiasts of it. And that is something, my friends, that we cannot kill. We cannot fight them. But we can. We can, my friends. We should, I think, in my humble opinion, dear listeners, we must, dare I even say, step up to the spiritual calling of healing with cannabis. Because it ain't no joke, friends. Cannabis heals. Now, having said that, I understand and respect the concerns that many people out there in virtual reality land and in real life as well express. And that's that there's something bad here, that there's something unhealthy about it, that it is ultimately addictive. In fact, I recently stumbled into an ongoing discussion about the, quote, addictive harms of cannabis. Um, which I found a bit annoying and frustrating because there's been plenty of medicinal investigation at this point to support the statement very strongly, if not outright prove, that cannabis is not chemically addictive. And the very sort of uh, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, not going to defend it, but I'm going to throw it at you kind of trolling, gaslighting counter-argument is that uh, we're kidding ourselves and it is very psychologically addictive. And I think it's worth delineating, and I made a note about this the other day um, when I encountered this weird discussion, that there is indeed, if I may be so bold as to suggest, a difference between those two things. Uh, and that we should, as a community of 420 enthusiasts, of 420 allies, of 420 friendly folks, of people who don't care one way or the other, and as, no, we are a community of communities, right? Um, we should, all of us together, regardless of our personal relationship with cannabis, strive to make an effort in understanding the difference between the two recognized forms of addiction. Because understanding that difference makes a world of difference in terms of how people treat other people, how people approach cannabis themselves, how cannabis and you interact. First of all, Chemical addiction is one thing, right? It is very specific, it is very real, it is very tangible, it is very measurable. And on that front, there's been plenty of studies enough already, and I'm sure um, I would applaud more coming out in underscoring and reassuring and reaffirming the statement that chemically speaking, cannabis is not addictive. And that the counter-argument that it is psychologically addictive is misleading. And here's why. Here's why, my friends. It, I'm not a scientist. So this is all capital I, capital M, capital H, capital O, in my humble opinion. Chemical addiction. Chemical addiction is tangible, 
verifiable, measurable, therefore repeatable, undeniable, and often not a reason why a product is ever banned. Eh? Alcohol? Chemically addictive. Cigarettes? Chemically addictive. And that's just the obvious ones. Coffee? Eh, chemically addictive. Although there the science gets pretty blurry and people say it's a little bit of both chemical and psychological. But uh, what else? Uh, soda has been, in some studies, shown to possibly be chemically addictive. Why? Because sugar has chemically uh, has chemical properties that can cause addiction. Now, let's be really, really clear here. What we're what I'm saying is, what I'm positing to, especially uh, to those who are trying to conflate the two kinds of addiction. Here's what I'm saying: something that is chemically addictive, uh, the addictiveness, the addiction can be directly and immediately blamed, quote-unquote, or attributed to the chemical compounds in that substance. And here's why. The human body strives for homeostasis, right? Or balance. It strives for feeling good. Uh, and obviously, the human body, the human experience, the human phenomena is biochemical. It's electrobiochemical in its nature. Our body uses, generates, conducts, utilizes, and discharges electricity. Our body um, inherently is made up of, composed of, and utilizes chemistry or chemicals. And, the, you know, that... It, it, it is the the what we call biology, right? Um, so when when a substance that is chemically addicting or addictive enters the human system, it alters the human electrobiochemistry. I don't want to say irrevocably, but in a dangerous way. It alters the human chemistry in such a fashion that in order to achieve a new homeostasis that feels good, that chemical substance is now a requirement, whereas before it was not. Okay? So, having said all that, what's the point? Psychological addiction operates completely differently, but renders a similar result. In other words... In chemical addiction, the change to our uh, homeostasis, our feeling good balancing point or balancing act is the fault of the newly introduced chemistry, the newly introduced chemical compounds that wreak havoc with our chemical balances and then establish a new hierarchy in the human ecosystem, right? A psychological addiction operates in a completely different way, although the end result may very much appear to be seemingly, and that word is not to be ignored, folks. People just blow right past the qualifier seems to be seemingly and just ignore what that means. Don't do that. It's very useful to comprehend why a word is in a sentence, but I digress. Psychological addiction is, categorically, a psychological phenomenon. Now, whether or not that means in the end you behave pretty similarly to someone that has a chemical addiction or not, here's the distinction is, that is worth understanding and pointing out. In a psychological addiction, the addiction originates, stems from can be attributed to and or blamed on, quote-unquote, the psychology of that given individual. 
and that the substance that that individual may have a, an addictive relationship to need not whatsoever have chemical properties that are measurably, scientifically labeled addictive. In other words, it is the mental procedures in the mind that require the utilization of said substances. Now, I'm not saying that the two are mutually exclusive, chemical addiction, psychological addiction. Blah, 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 blah. Um, in, in, in most worst case scenarios, and by that I mean someone who is addicted to something, boom, that's a worst case scenario. You don't want to be addicted to anything. Let's not go down the scary rabbit hole of whether or not breathing air is an addiction, right? Um, because once you start unpacking definitions too loosely, you start being able to fall into those kinds of slippery slopes. And I use that as a rhetorical device in that conversation I referenced earlier. I'm like, by your reckoning, breathing air is an addiction. Uh, it was something I threw into the conversation. And they were like, blah, 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 no. And I'm like, okay, 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 okay. So breathing air is not an addiction. Why? We do it. And if we stop doing it, we experience withdrawals, right? When we do it, we feel good. When we don't do it, we feel bad. I mean, that's what you were saying about cannabis earlier in the conference. Not you, my dear listener, but the person I was having a conversation with. That's essentially what they were saying about cannabis is, you know, we're addicted to it because we can't cope with our lives. And I'm like, perhaps those people who exhibit addiction-like behavior around cannabis are addicted to it at a psychological level. But that right there, if it is free of any other chemical um, influences, that right there is a psychological problem. And if it's a psychological problem, it is inherently a problem. And I'm not being rude here. I'm not trying to be critical of anyone. I'm trying to delineate two things that are being conflated. If it's a psychological problem and the substance in question, let's say it was something really benign that had, everyone could agree, zero chemical properties that were addictive. That's a really hard thing to point out. Like, what is there out there that we can say has zero addictive properties? Because, like, food, from a very cynical lens, can be looked at as an addiction. Um, but returning to my question here, if if uh, if there's a person with an addiction relationship, an addiction-like relationship with a substance that we can all agree, scientifically speaking, um, has no chemicals that we would designate as habit-forming or addictive, then that addiction cannot be blamed on that substance, can it? No. That addiction can be blamed in some problem in the psychological inner workings of that individual. Now, often, like I just said, and just acknowledged, the two happen simultaneously. A person with an addictive psychological disorder will often very um, enthusiastically become addicted to substances with chemical addictive properties. But that does not mean that uh, every addiction is both and that every addiction is chemical. There are many addictions that are purely psychological. Now, I get it. I know where some people are going or might be going with the response to my statement. Where does one draw the line in the very spirally rabbit hole problem of what is psychology, if not a lot of chemistry, right? Let's put a pin in that, come back to it. We'll, uh, we'll have to address that in a whole other level. My point is that at a fundamental level, there can be a substance with chemical addictive properties because of its inherent chemistry, and there can be a substance with zero addictive um, chemical properties uh, and those two substances, in terms of any addictive relationships that people have with them, 
should be approached and dealt with differently, shouldn't they? I think, personally, they should. Now, obviously, in all worst-case scenarios, if a person becomes addicted to a chemical, they then, I'm sure, develop a psychological addiction, that the one follows the other pretty commonly. Otherwise, um, quitting cigarettes wouldn't be so hard. You can come to full terms uh, in understanding that the chemistry of cigarettes are bad for you and addictive and that you want to stop. Um, and you can even overcome the withdrawal phase and the, and the cravings and all that in a sort of short-term sprint of not smoking. And you may even loose the bonds of the actual chemical addiction and then months later, years later, decades later, fall right back into the habit without the blink of an eye because of the psychological component, for sure. Uh, and I'm acknowledging that, I'm not denying that, I'm not trying to argue that that is not the case. But I am suggesting to you that there must be, you know, all things are possible in an infinite universe, um, that, and, and in our own experience, uh, there's quite a lot of wiggle room, although we can't experience all of infinity, right? There's a lot of wiggle room for, for what is possible. Uh, and, and I posit to you, friends, that yes, there will, we will encounter people that have unhealthy relationships with cannabis. I've known them. I have experienced that uh, in real life. I have met people and I'm like, wow, not judging here, bro, but my discernment leads me to suggest that maybe your relationship with cannabis is unnecessary in your life. Um, right? And so the approach to dealing with those problematic relationships really should be radically different. And we should not be throwing out babies with the bathwater. And what babies do I mean? Cannabis heals, cannabis feeds, cannabis fuels, cannabis clothes, cannabis houses especially once you take the two sister cousin plants together, cannabis and hemp, they render so many viable and important products that are more than competitive against the, their traditional you know, uh, products being used out there that, uh, that we should not allow the, the vilification and the marginalization efforts of cannabis and hemp to continue under this, this conflating bullshittery argument um, of it's addictive and that means bad. The human being as a species is an addiction. We're addicted to being alive. We're addicted to surviving. We're addicted to perpetuating our own species. One could argue. One could say, right? Maybe that's a bit cynical of me to put it that way, but there it is. My point is this, friends. We are truly at the beginning of a new era. Not just for all the reasons I just rambled about in Almost Daily, but for the simple fact that we have reached a major tipping point in the cannabis rights activism movement. And as we enter this new era and uh, the culture progresses faster than real time and money encroaches and big canna becomes a thing if it isn't already because it's on its way, I'm sure. Just like there's... <laughs> I just saw an article not too long ago about Big Razor. Right? Like... What? But yeah, apparently. I'll have to go dig that article up and see what it's about and maybe ramble about it in some other segment. But I digress. We're, we're hurtling forward in time into a future where we hope, we assume, as cannabis enthusiasts, as... Uh, hippy dippy new age woo woo nut jobs, potheads and stoners, 
right? That everything's just going to work out cool, man. It's all going to be groovy, dude. And like, you know, cannabis is going to rule the world. No. Money talks, bullshit walks, and big corporate interests always get what they want unless we stand firm. Cannabis is spiritual. Cannabis heals. Cannabis also has a sense of humor. Yeah, I just said that. I just personified a plant. And if you're new to my uh, show, you might be like, oh, God, this, must, this guy must be crazy. But there's uh, put a big red pin in this because we got to come back to it. I've done an episode or two out there somewhere where I talk about it at some length, but I really want to do a deep dive and then I'll do this in future. But um, as the documentary, The Secret Lives of Plants, very clearly illustrates, living plants are vessels of consciousness because life itself is consciousness. But I digress. Cannabis has a sense of humor. Cannabis has a sense of, fuck you, just like we do. And cannabis also is here to facilitate. So if we approach cannabis with a blasé bullshit attitude about getting fucked up, guess what happens? If we approach cannabis with honor, respect, ritual, spiritual integrity, and a willingness to be healed and an interest in communing, then it's a whole nother ball game, folks. Truly and sincerely, I mean these words. And the problem is, while it's super awesome that we get to smoke weed as easily as we can drink beer in our own homes now in an ever-growing number of states, um, the real problem is that just like the beer industry is profiteering on our slippery slope fight against alcoholism at a personal individual level, Big Canna is going to rear its ugly head one day in the not-too-distant future and fuck things up unless we, as the enthusiasts and the, the curators of culture and the individuals that make up this segment of society, if we take a stand, if we do not let the... Uh, bombardment of advertisers or advertising, if we don't let the marketing madmen take over, then we can perpetuate a culture of cannabis use that is not radically detached from the spiritual significances or significance and important qualities that are spiritual in nature of cannabis. Wow, that last paragraph uh, could have been phrased way more um, uh, well <laughs> and uh, with better structures, but hey, this show, uh, all the segments they're in, except of course the ones in which I tell you that I'm reading from a script, are always genuine, authentic, unscripted, and 100% really me telling you what I think. And having said that, I want to leave you with this thought, my friends. Cannabis couture is bullshit. We don't need high fashion cannabis, blah, 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 anything. We don't need million dollar cannabis fashion clothing lines. We don't need tricked out, super deluxe, cannabis themed nonsensical objects that we buy purely for the sake of buying because they rep a cannabis culture icon, right? Like, we don't need really cute cannabis clothes for April 20th. What we need is a clarity of understanding, a freedom from psychological manipulation, and an 
interpersonal spiritual relationship with this ally from the realm of plant life. That's what we need, in my humble opinion. And by that I mean that those things are important to our well-being, not from some magical reasoning, but because cannabis is something we used to have a long, long time ago in the ancient mists of prehistory, a spiritual and survival-related relationship with. And that we don't right now. And that young people who are excited for 420 are rarely ever aware of the depth of meaning available to them when it comes to how they relate to cannabis, right? Too many young people today think that cannabis is some safer alternative to getting fucked up wasted on booze. Because getting shit-faced drunk is something America has loved since we won the war on uh, intolerance uh, back in the uh, uh, abolition days, right? But we actually lost that war, dear friends, because while alcohol as it is mass-produced today is categorically toxic and unhealthy, in my humble opinion, it was once produced manufactured, consumed, shared, partaken in, in a spiritual way, for spiritual reasons. I'm not trying to dictate that people need to do things according to my preferences. Don't misunderstand me. I'm just saying we should be aware of these facts and take them into account and vote with our minds and our hearts and our mouths and our voting booths for a culture, a cannabis culture, an alcohol culture, a societal culture that understands these things deeply and does not let big money interests profiteer on our ignorance of these things. Why? Why do I advocate that? You might be asking yourself, simple. If we take that stand, if we build that community understanding, if we curate that cultural appreciation, we will have a better time when we smoke weed. And that's what I got to say about that right now, my dear friends. As always, I humbly thank you for tuning in. I know that you've got a lot of entertainment options out there. That there's a shit ton of content you could be mindlessly listening to. And the fact that you choose my show not only am I flattered and honored, but I am inspired and uh, renewed because I'm not here to entertain you. I'm not here to impress anybody. And I, quite frankly, very Johnny Cash-like, do not give a fuck about people who choose to judge me for what I got to say, right? If I were to have a professional photo shoot scheduled today or tomorrow or whatever, one of the things I'd be eager to ask that photographer is, can I do a shot where I reenact the Johnny Cash fuck you to the camera from on stage while ripping the guitar moment and, you know, replace the guitar with bong and a microphone or something. A microphone bong. Mm. Yeah, that wouldn't work 
as an actual thing, but visually, comedy. As a prop, yes. As an actual recording device, no. Nah. But I digress. Uh, why would I want to recreate that photo show? Because, or that, that photographic moment from history, because I myself, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo, uh, very akin to uh, the dear old uh, Johnny Cash, don't give two shits about people who want to spew hate at me and want to judge me for the things that they can't understand about what I got to say. Now, I don't mean that in a mean dismissive way. I mean that, that their negativity ain't going to get me down. Those people that I give the bird to, um, I also love, right? Because that's what we got to do. That's what we got to do as a species. Not because I think it's important and not even because that's what Jesus and Buddha and Gandhi and Krishna and Muhammad and all of them taught. But because if we don't love each other, even those we do not like, we are doomed as a species. Right? Because if we can't love past dislike, we'll just end up hating. And hate, friends, as I'm sure you've heard me say before, does not solve shit. And so I invite you to join me, especially around the 420 o'clock hour and in anticipation of this upcoming April 20th, which is now closer and more around the corner than the last one was. Uh, I mean, in terms of, you know, where, which one's closer in time. Well, I don't know. I haven't actually done the math on that. And I, I hate to make myself a liar or sound like an ignorant fool. Um, but I'm not concerned about how many weeks out we are. I'll have to start a countdown, though. Um, as we approach April 20th, which is surely not 44 weeks away, right? Uh, not more than 15 weeks away? January, February, March, April? I'm guessing. That was a really weak ballpark, didn't do any math, kind of guesstimate, which is not important. As we approach... April 20th, 2020. Let's not get swept up in the commercial, mindless, shopping, binging, blah, blah, blah of it that the moneyed interests are peddling. Let's stay grounded, rooted, dare I say, in the deeper truths of why we want to freely associate with this plant. We didn't fight for our right to party, as the, um, as the song goes. We fought for our right to not be oppressed, not be enslaved, not be incarcerated, just because we want to grow, eat, smoke, and otherwise consume this delightful little plant that maybe, just maybe, might help us figure out how to save ourselves from our own self-destruction. As always, friends, thank you for tuning in. I have been your cannabis mystic host, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo, rambling in stony circles about cannabis culture, railing against its commodification, and warning against the vilification of the spiritual attributes. Because that will happen. At the more welcome cannabis becomes as a mainstream thing that's equivalent to in the marketplace. Um, of things they privateer on to alcohol, the more the spiritual side of it will be swept away, thrown out with the bathwater and all those precious babies that we're constantly saying we shouldn't throw out, and vilified, marginalized. And then there'll be this like doubling back on it, right? Alcohol, we fought so hard. Think back, for those of you, I mean, None of us are of an age to remember this anymore, I don't think, unless you are a time traveler or, um, you know, a super age person, an immortal. 
uh, which there may or may not be of some of those walking amongst us here in this particular dimension. But uh, abolition and the return to the freedom of being able to buy alcohol was a huge effort, and it was about our right of self-determination, right? But if you get really serious and you detach yourself from whatever attachments you have to alcohol as an entertainment product, we literally fought for our right to drink toxic waste poison. Because already, at that point, the way it was being mass-produced was no longer in alignment with... It was no longer attenuated to the spiritual way in which alcohol could be cultivated, created, produced, and consumed. Okay? With everything we do, there's a big fat fork in the road. And we might feel like it's too late, we can't go back to that fork because it's way in the past. But the fork in the road exists every day in the probable... um, the probability waveform function unfolding before us. And that choice, that polemic, is we can do this the spiritual way, the holistic way, right? The the I don't want to call it the right way, because then we get into the argument of what is right and whose measure of right, and that really just turns into righteousness. But we can do this the healthy way, or we can do this the toxic waste profiteering way. Okay? And I assure you that with enough um, open-minded, thorough research, you too will come to understand that this is real. And that this happened, this was done to alcohol. And I don't mean during the time of abolition. And I don't mean post-abolition, you know, boom either. Although that was an extension of that trend, right? Every day we get to choose, but every day the choice gets harder because we've been choosing doing things the toxic waste profiteering way for a very long time, arguably, since the Tower of Babel was toppled. But that's a whole other episode, past and future. Uh, I'll leave you with this, friends. Cannabis heals. Cannabis helps. Cannabis also uh, serves up karma. Mm. That's a tricky one, right? If you use and abuse it, it will use and abuse you right back. Thanks for listening. I welcome your feedback, your questions, your comments. Find me on the Instagram, the Facebook, the Twitter, the YouTube. Uh, And if there's a cool social media platform that's cannabis-centric or cannabis-friendly that I don't know about yet, tell me. Send me a link, send me an invite, help me get to it. Until next time, signing off today with half a bowl yet to finish, I am the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo. Well, folks, that bowl is cashed and dusted. (laughs) Thank you for joining me for yet another most excellent session of Cannabis Talk. Stay lit, pay it forward, and remember, the world needs healing, and cannabis heals. Until next time, I have been your spiritual cannabis mystic talk show host, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo. dear friend of mine uh, said, used to say, I mean, I guess he still says it, I don't know. He would say, after a good, solid coughing fit, 
he would like kudos himself, like he'd pat himself on the back to tell him like, yeah, way to get it in there. And I would ask him after, I asked him once after a while of watching him do that, like, what do you, what is that about, man? And he, uh, he responded, when you're coughing, it's like the opposite of when you're coughing because of cigarettes. When you have a smoker's cough, you're like hacking out your lung because it's all gross and nasty and dying from the tar. When you've got the cannabis cough, you're getting the healing nutrients, CBDs and THCs from the cannabis smoke deeper in your lungs, which is helping to push out and clean all the gross, nasty shit. So that cough is like healing. It's the healing cough. Of course, I was, I am severely paraphrasing him. And I was, and he was, uh, at the time of that conversation, we were both extremely high. But I digress. A little bonus material for uh, the next Cannabis Talk episode. Okay. <clears throat> and now for the outro. Fly high, stay grounded. Get lit, but don't burn yourself. <laughs>